All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome on Shuffling Landscapes. This is a webinar on the impact of landslides on topographical evolution. The webinar is part of a series on modeling topics hosted by CSDMS, which is the Community Surface Dynamics Modeling System. And hence, unsurprisingly, we will be talking about modeling landslides today. And I'm going to give a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. So we will start with the question why we actually study landslides in the first place. Next, I'm going to tell a bit about the numerical landscape evolution model, the Highlands model. That will be followed by a small demonstration where I show some of the new components we developed in Land Lab. I'm going to talk a bit on how you can run all of this yourself on your own computer or in the cloud. And finally, I will get back to my original question as to what extent such landscape evolution model can be used to understand better what landslides do in evolving landslides, landscapes. And then we will end with some questions. So if you have a question, um, please hold it for the end and we will have time to discuss um, all of these. So let's start with the question, why do we study the impact of landslides? And to answer that question, I'm gonna take you to what I call two end member landscapes. On the left-hand side, you see a part of the Northern Appalachian Plateau in Ohio. And this landscape experiences very little to zero months of surface uplift, resulting in quote unquote, old landscapes with very well developed dendritic fluvial networks, moderate rolling topography, not very steep slopes. And as a result of that, you don't really see a lot of deep seeded bedrock landslides in such areas. So with bedrock landslides, I mean landslides that are um, rupturing through the bedrock. What you do see in areas like Ohio is shallow landslide activity, where part of your soil is going to move over the interface between your, so between your soil and your soil um, bedrock um, at that interface. On the other hand of the spectrum, you have landscapes such as the Central Mountain Range in Taiwan that do experience very high amounts of surface uplift, resulting in steep topography, deeply incised river gorges, and hence a bunch of deep-seated landslides. And you can, for example, see one here in the middle of your screen. So this is an example of a relatively recent um, deep-seated bedrock landslides. Now, we also plotted the drainage network for these two landscapes. And if you look at the drainage network, and you zoom in on, on part of the network, uh, what you see is for the Ohio case, which is the upper figure in the, in the middle row, you see this indeed nicely developed dendritic fluvial network. Whereas if you look at the Taiwanese um, network, what we see is very steep quasi planar slopes with narrowly spaced, almost linear channel features. So both of these subplots are made by taking a fixed uh, threshold value for the drainage area. So by looking at these drainage networks, we clearly see that there's a difference between both. And one of the questions is how are landslides actually influencing the shape of these um, drainage networks? Another observation we can make for those two end member cases um, is that if you look at the slope frequency distribution, where you just plot all the slope values um, on a frequency diagram, you basically see for both, but especially for the Taiwanese case, that the slope distribution shows a right, shows a, a right tailed distribution. So what you see is that there's many slope patches exceeding what is often referred to as a threshold slope or a theoretical angle of repose which we often consider as a value where landscapes evolve to if you have like a lot of bedrock landsliding events. So, but if you actually look to the measured topography, we see this nice tail. So both plots are the same, left and right. The right-hand plot is plotted in a semi-log space. So the uh, Y 
axes in log, val in log values to accentuate all of these slopes that actually exceed what is often considered to be threshold slope values. So let's say that in highly tectonic uh, active regions with strong lithology, um, we often consider a slope of 1.2 meters per meters as a threshold slope. But if you look to existing topography, you see that there's a bunch of slope patches that actually exceed um, those angles of repose, those theoretical value uh, for the threshold slopes. So that's two observations um, from measured topography, the drainage network and the slope distribution uh, that learn us something about the role of landslides in landscapes. Now, there's another issue. Um, so one of the questions of, or one of the current debates really is um, what is the, the status or the, the shape of, of steady state landscapes? And um, there is debate whether landscapes, if they evolve towards uh, equilibrium, evolve towards, towards a fixed or frozen equilibrium, where the morphology of landscapes um, remains kind of fixed through time, and where, uniform, where erosion would be uniform over the entire landscape. So that's one um, end of the spectrum. Whereas the other theory says, landscapes evolve towards a highly dynamic equilibrium where ridges and rivers are constantly on the move and where topo topography can be inverted in such a way that existing ridges become fluvial valleys and vice versa. So like in the two pictures you see, the left hand is actually a sandbox experiment where they show that landscapes actually never evolve towards this frozen equilibrium states, but um, rather evolve towards a dynamic equilibrium where you see all this um, lateral channel um, mobility, lateral uh, ridge mobility going on. And the right hand figure is a theoretical study that recently came out showing that um, lateral fluvial channel dynamics indeed uh, force a, lands, a landscape to go towards this dynamic um, equilibrium where neither ridges nor valleys are fixed through time, but keep on moving constantly. And our question is, can landslides ex actually explain such a, a persistent dynamism in the landscape? And can these landslides be used as one of the processes to explain um, such mobility? So that's the, the science questions we want to answer. And that's actually why we are developing these landscape evolution models that do uh, simulate landslide activity. Um, so like a brief recap, we have the differences in the shape of the drainage networks. We have the right skewed slope frequency plots. And we have um, landscape dynamism, which we want to explain with landscape evolution models explicitly simulating these landslides. So that's the scientific background of studying landslides in landscape evolution models. And this is why we developed Highlands. And Highlands is a hybrid landscape evolution model. And it's hybrid in the sense that every pixel can turn from like a fluvial domain into a hill slope domain. And with a fluvial domain, I mean both incision and sediment transport. And with a hill slope domain in this case, um, typically this would be landslide erosion. So in the highlands model, we have two components. We have a fluvial component and we have a landslide component. For the fluvial component, we have both incision as well as deposition. And we simulate the fluvial dynamics using the space model that Charlie Shoby developed a couple of years ago. Um, and in the space model, Rivers can dynamically transition from detachment limited states to transport limited states. So, and if you want to know more about this, the space model, I uh, invite you to, to go check um, Charlie's paper in, in geoscientific model development in 2017. So, that's for the fluvial components. A second component we have in our Highlands model are obviously the landslides. And to simulate landslides, we assume a more Coulomb stability analysis, or we do a more Coulomb stability analysis to calculate what the rupture plane of your landslide would be. So basically what it means is we're going to identify critical nodes in the landscapes, the blue dots, 
And from these critical nodes, we're going to calculate the rupture plane of your landslides. And the rupture plane is actually calculated as the angle bisecting the angle of internal friction of your materials, which is the lower black line over here, and the actual topography of your current relief. And the rupture plane is calculated as the straight line bisecting those two angles. And it's going to start at the critical node and it's going to propagate all the way until it daylights right here. And all the pixels that are exceeding or the topography of pixels that exceeding this rupture plane um, is, are going to erode and they're going to erode up to the elevation of the rupture plane, the red material, and then it's going to be deposited downstream of these critical nodes. For the deposition of your sediment, we use a non-local diffusion algorithm developed by Sébastien Cartier in 2016. And it's going to help in like spreading out or calculating the landslide runout, the runout of your sediment. And, and we use it to calculate the deposition rate of sediment um, in space. One more thing that's interesting to note is that the way we calculate the location of these critical nodes or the location where the landslides actually start forming by using a stochastic algorithm. And the stochastic algorithm has two components. It has a spatial component. And the spatial component is going to be based on the gradient of your topography. So the steeper, the higher the chance of sliding, basically. And it has a temporal component in which we sample randomly from a Poisson distribution through time. And we combine those two probabilities to calculate an actual, actual probability for failure. And then we use a stochastic sampler to define whether or not we will trigger or initiate a landslide. So of course, in reality, um, the triggering of landslides is often associated to earthquakes or storms or human activity in some cases. Um, so that would um, represent our stochastic um, triggering of landslides. So that's how the landslide algorithm basically works. If you would draw that in three dimensions, it looks like this, where we again have this critical node, which is the blue square from where landslide planes, rupture planes start propagating upstream. The red dots are the cells where we are going to see erosion and then the eroded volumes is going to be um, spread out following the, the green arrows here in the bottom. And to spread out the sediment, we use a multiple flow direction algorithm so that you can basically go from uh, one cell to each to its eight neighbors. Um, so that's how the landslide algorithm works. And we published the landslide algorithm um, earlier, no, in, in 2020, summer 2020, in uh, a GMD paper called Highlands. Um, a, a hybrid landscape evolution model, et cetera. So if you want to find out more about the algorithms and the implementation of the uh, method, you can find it in this paper. Now, what you will find interesting um, is if you go and check this paper, you will see that we implemented our first version of Highlands in MATLAB in the Topo Toolbox landscape evolution model, um, which is originally developed by Wolfgang Schwanghardt. And over the last year and a half, basically, um, we moved from, from, it's still there, you can still use it, if you like in TTLAM, uh, but we re-implemented our algorithms in LandLab so that we can use it in, in our open source uh, software packages. So what is LandLab? Um, most of you on the call probably know, but um, LandLab is a Python engine um, or um, a package of, of, of numerical modeling tools to simulate earth surface dynamics. And it basically does several things. Um, first thing it does is it has a grid engine and we use a grid engine to basically represent our uh, spatial domain. And we use the grid to calculate our um, numerical equations or to, to calculate our earth surface processes. Um, Another very important ingredient of LandLab is um, are the, the, the model components. So we have a bunch of components to calculate all kinds of earth surface processes. And then there's um, some utilities we use for plotting, for example. Um, so there's a bunch of functions to do um, plotting. And so we recently uh, developed this LandLab Highlands um, 
components. And basically, the LandLab Highlands, you have to see LandLab Highlands as a landscape evolution model. So Highlands is a model, and it exists out of several uh, new components we developed. So basically, in um, over the last couple of months, we developed three new components to, um, to create this, this Highlands numerical landscape evolution model. The first component is the priority flood flow director. The priority flood flow director is a new flow router we developed. And the reason for that is the following. So if you have a bunch of landslides going on in, um, in the landscape, you can imagine that all these landslides generate a lot of sediments. And the sediment is going to block rivers and is going to create what you um, typically know as a landslide dam and is going to invert your topography. So basically what you do is um, you build a lot of lakes in your landscape and um, this is going to complicate um, water flow calculations because if you have a lake and invert topography, the water doesn't necessarily know where to go. So what we typically do is we breach the DEM or we fill the DEM to calculate um, the new location of your streams. And this is a pretty expensive operation. And this is why we developed this new flow director, which is basically wrapping an existing Python package called RichDem. RichDem is a very nice Python tool developed by Richard Barnes, which is especially designed to calculate uh, flow routing and filling and breaching over large DEMs. And it's efficient because it uses um, it, it parallelizes the process of calculating um, um, flow directions. So that's the first component we developed. The second component we developed is um, space large scale eroder. Space large scale eroder is basically derived from the original space code as Charlie Shoby developed it, but it's designed so that it can be used on larger scales. It's a bit more robust against bigger time steps. And hence um, we can um, increase the performance of our large scale landscape evolution models a lot by using this. And then the final component we developed is the bedrock landslider, which is obviously, um, which contains obviously the landslide algorithm I just briefly explained. And then finally, um, I also added one new uh, utility function, which is called imshow HS grids, and HS stands for hill shades. So this plotting function is going to allow you to plot shaded relief and to add additional information on your shaded relief. And we will do an example of that in the um, tutorials. So now I'm going to risk something and I'm going to do a, a small mini demonstration. Um, so let's see if I can show how the um, Highlands algorithm works. So I'm going to exit my presentation. I'm going to move to my browser. Is everyone seeing this? Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Um, so this is a small tutorial I made, um, especially for the Highlands model. And it's going to be available to you if you want. So you can try to play with all this. Um, little notebooks, you'll see that we start with a short introduction on um, LandLab. So there's a bunch of information on the, um, it's basically the read the docs of LandLab. So there's basically information on how to install LandLab, how to run simple components. Um, I also added a link to the tutorials uh, where you can find a bunch of notebooks on how to run different components in LandLab. And then the first thing we're going to do is we're going to try to simulate some bedrock landslides on a landscape. So let's click the link. Fingers crossed. And there we go. Um, so there's a lot of documentation in these notebooks, and I'm not necessarily going over all of that today. Um, I, want, I want to do a quick demonstration um, just for you to get the ID, and because all of this is going to be available for you to play with, and just take your time to, to go through it after this. Um, so we typically start in Python by importing a bunch of packages we will use for our, our calculations. So let's look what we have here. So we have NumPy. NumPy is, is often used to do um, all kinds of uh, arithmetic operations in Python. We have the um, 
matplotlib um, libraries, which we use for plotting. And then all of this is going to be LandLab stuff. Um, so what you see here is actually importing the components we're going to use. And the new ones are, for example, the priority flood flow router, the bedrock landslider, channel profiler is another prof, um, component we use for plotting that, that already existed before. Um, other stuff we do is read net CDF. We're going to read in an existing DEM, so we need to read the data. Um, what else? The raster model grid is, for example, the component you use um, to create um, a grid in LandLab. Right. So a couple of months ago, uh, Mark Pagler, who you just heard, um, developed a very nice uh, package. Um, it's called the BMI topography. Um, package and it's actually made to download SRTM data just by providing four coordinates. And it's based on the Open Topography API. So we will um, actually download the SRTM data through their um, API. And to do this, um, it's a very simple task. So you're going to um, initialize um, a topography. Um, components by using the topography function. I say which kind of DEM I want to download. So I set SRTM um, one. And I give four coordinates listed over here. And I say that I want to have the output as an ASCII file. And the DEM data is going to define where I store my actual data. So when I run this cell, it's going to initialize this topography. Um, this topography components, say. Now, by initializing it, we're not yet downloading it. So we have to actually fetch the data. So if this, is, if this sounds uh, complicated, don't worry about it. So like all the um, explanation is here. And also I added a link um, for more documentation on how this component works. And once we downloaded the data, you can also um, load the DEM, it's going to print some of the properties. But obviously what we want to do is we want to visualize um, the DEM. And to do that, we're going to read it. So now we downloaded the data. Now we're going to read this data into LandLab. And the way we do that is by using the read S3 ASCII function, which is a LandLab function. F name is going to refer to the name we gave to the data we downloaded. So you're going to find F name over here, uh, let's see, F name. So when, when we fetch the data, F name is going to be one of the output arguments. And it's going to consist of the coordinates of your DEM, basically, and the location where you store the data. So we're going to read the downloaded DEM into LandLab by using the read L3 function. And I'm going to plot the function. I'm going to plot the data. So the data you see here um, is this nice DEM. And you might wonder where this is. Um, and actually, this is going to be Boulder. So if you look to the DEM, you basically see, if you if you are familiar uh, with the Boulder area, you basically see um, Green Mountain over here. Uh, this is going to be Bear Peak, and this is going to be South Boulder Peak. And then you see the flat irons in front. All right, so as a nice intermezzo, I just want to mention that um, obviously I present from somewhere here in Boulder um, and we are, I'm presenting on, on the former grounds of the Arapaho, the Cheyenne and the UT uh, tribes. And I was wondering as a small break because I'm thirsty, uh, where you all from, are from. So you can uh, feel free to, to enter in the chat from, from which place you are zooming in today. I'm curious to see that. Uh, from Bellingham. More Boulder people. People from Europe. That's nice. Good evening. across the stadium. More people from Europe, Austria. 
from Brazil, from Rem. People all over the world, I love it. From Colombia, cool. Michigan. Excellent. Um, so we have our data for the, for, the, for the Boulder area. We have our flat iron sitting there. There's, a, there's only one problem. So if you look to the plot, you see that we actually downloaded the data in a geographical uh, reference system. So that means in um, decimal degrees. And obviously, when we want to calculate landslides, we want to have it in, in metric units so that we can easily calculate slopes, et cetera. So we have to reproject our data. Um, and now um, we're going to do like uh, a small little trick, and we're going to assume that um, our data is actually spaced by 30 meters, which is more or less what it is for SRTM1. Um, so we're going to make a new LandLab grid. So I'm going to make a new grid by using this raster model grid function. And then once I have actually initialized the grid, I'm going to ascribe the elevation data to that new grid and assume that the spacing of your grid cells is indeed this 30 meters. In reality, when you want to do this, you actually have to use um, a better projection function, uh, something like GDAL to do it more correctly. But for now, we're going to use that trick. So we're going to make a new grid, assign the values, and then plot the data. So one thing that's interesting to note here is that here I'm using this new utility. So it's called IMSHO HS from Hillshades. Um, and it works like the input arguments are pretty similar to what you used for IMSHO, the original LATLAB function. But now this time, if you plot it, you're going to create this nice um, shaded relief below your actual topography. And um, you see how the flat irons come out nicely and how these uh, different peaks I mentioned before um, are nicely visible in the picture. All right. So the next cell is basically a cell that I, I wrote to do all of this plotting. Um, you can look at it if you want. It's a function we are going to call to plot stuff. For example, if I call the plotting function, which is, so I create a function here, and it's called plotting with a bunch of input arguments. If I call the plotting function, you're just going to plot the same topographical elevation. DA is false equals false means that I don't want to plot the flow accumulation. The reason why I'm not plotting the flow accumulation is because we haven't calculated it just yet. So to calculate flow accumulation, we're going to use this new priority flood flow router, which is going to take a bunch of input arguments. And something that I always find very helpful when you're working in a Jupyter notebook is to look at the function you're actually calling. So you can do that by going behind uh, the function and then hit shift tab and then if you um, click the plus sign here you see all the input arguments with the default values and you also get access to the documentation of the function so if you scroll down you're going to see some text explaining what the function does and you're going to see some additional um, information on um, all the input arguments and, and output arguments all right, so we're going to run this. Um, something that's important to know is that in this new flow director function, you can calculate simultaneously a single flow direction map and a multiple flow direction map. And the reason why we developed it like that is because for some components, such as Highlands, um, you want to have um, both single flow and multiple flow. So if you're making a model, such as Highlands, you want to calculate fluvial incision using the single flow routers, and you want the multiple flow to spread this um, landslide-derived sediment when you're running your uh, bedrock landslider. And by combining it in one flow router, you can, again, win um, some performance because you don't have to calculate um, the flow routing over the, the, the filled areas over the lakes twice while running uh, in one time step. So you can do it at the same time, the multiple and the single flow routing. So to do that, I actually have to say, um, calculate a separate hill flow. So separate uh, flow directions over the hill slopes. I set it to true. And also I want to accumulate our, um, our flow over the hill slopes. 
So if we, if we run this component, you're gonna see that we, this is like the topography as we plotted it before. And now we do plot our flow accumulation. And the first plot is um, the steepest, um, steepest descent algorithm um, routing over the eight neighbor, uh, neighboring cells. And the second flow accumulation is a multiple flow accumulation plot where water can go in several directions in the meantime. All right, so now we have our DEM. We projected the DEM and we calculated the flow directors. The next thing we're gonna do is calculate the landslides. So before we do that, we have to add a field to our um, landlab grid. So I'm using a lot of terminology. If landlab is entirely new to you and you don't know what uh, fields are or what grids are, um, in the interest of time, I cannot talk a lot about it today, but we do have like other webinars where we go back to the basics of LandLab, where you can just go into the documentation of LandLab and, and um, try to read up um, on, on all of these things. So, but in LandLab, we create a grid and we assign a bunch of fields to the grid. Fields contain values for the elevation, but also for other, um, other properties you want to store on the grid. And with landslides, we don't just want to um, store the elevation. We also want to know how much soil or sediment there is over the grid because we calculate erosion and deposition of the landslides. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a field called soil depth, which is going to represent sediment thickness. And once you've done that, you can actually initialize, um, uh, um, you can initialize um, an, an object of the bedrock landslider um, class or component. That's again, some terminology, don't worry about it, but you have to initialize um, the landslider first before you can actually run it. So that's what we are doing in these lines. There's a couple of input arguments. So for example, we um, give the angle of internal friction, which is a material strength property. And we set, we set it to a pretty low value in this case. So 0.5 meters per meters is actually too low for the kind of materials we have in the boulder area. Um, but I, I set it um, that low deliberately to show you what potential landslides could do in this area. So all of this is, is purely hypothetical. Um, in, in, for real situations, you, you want to bump up this value of in, internal friction. Another component, another parameter we need is the return time for landslides. So when I was explaining the algorithm, I said that we have a stochastic time sampler and the amount of landslides we sampled through time is going to depend on the return time for landslides. Now, think of this parameter as um, the return time for, for example, big storms or, or big earthquakes. And um, the longer it takes for a big earthquake to occur, the higher the value for this parameter will be. And then finally, we have a cohesion value. That's another material property um, that's going to be needed to, to run the um, to run the sliding algorithm. And once we initialize the component, we will also run it. So every LandLab component has a run one step function that's actually going to execute a sample over a given amount of time. And in our case, we say run it for 50 years. All right, this landslide function, once you run it, it's also going to return something. Um, those are two values. It's um, the amount of sediment that is mobilized and the amount of sediment that's being evacuated out of your grid. So you don't have to worry about it for now. So let's see if we can visualize all of this. Um, and let's start by plotting the magnitude frequency distributions of your landslides. And this is pretty interesting. It's, um, if, you, if, you, if you look at landslide literature, the magnitude frequency distribution is a property of landslides that's very often plotted. It's gonna give the area of the landslides and then the amount of landslides you have for a given area. And typically in the field, you always see like a rollover where you start with a little amount of small landslides, then you increase, and then the amount of bigger landslides is going um, to decrease again. And we can um, quite successfully reconstruct this um, magnitude frequency distribution by running the Highlands algorithm. And now this is like um, a simulation with relatively unrealistic values for, for example, the angle of internal friction. Uh, but if you would look in this GMD paper I mentioned earlier, um, you can see how we ran the Highlands algorithm 
for a region in um, Nepal, the Namche Barwa region, where we also um, reconstruct these magnitude frequency distributions. And then finally, um, let's see where we have actually erosion and deposition in our landscape. So the first plot is showing the erosion rates. So there's a bunch of erosion going on um, at, at um, where, where the mountains are going up. And then obviously you also have um, this deposition of sediment. And to plot this a little bit nicer, you can also plot it on top of um, this shaded relief where you see how the landslides typically occur on the steeper parts of your landscape. And then the deposition is gonna be downslope of the actual landslides. And then one final trick you can do. So there's a bunch of code, and this is um, all about this new like IMSO um, hillshade grid function that's going to help to plot you uh, various values on top of shaded relief. So this, this last thing is actually um, going to plot your topography. And then on top of that, it plots both the landslide erosion as well as the deposition. So you get to see this, this nice landslide looking shapes and then the runout of your sediment in blue, showing where the sediment will be uh, deposited after a landslide event. So that is a very quick introduction to the bedrock landslider, basically. Now, obviously, you want to combine this uh, bedrock landslider with other functions we have in uh, LandLab or other components we have in LandLab. Um, so I'm going to go back to the index. So what you see is there's two more tutorials that are basically on the use of this new priority flood algorithm and that are going to show how much more performant um, this algorithm is in comparison to the, the older version. Um, so I'm not going to do all of them, but I, I can quickly show how it's going to operate on real topography. So what we do in this um, tutorial is we download uh, an SRTM DEM as we did before, and then we will run the space component or the new space large scale eroder component on this um, downloaded SRTM DEM time, how long it takes to execute and do that for the um, existing functions and for the new um, priority flood flow director. Um, so if we execute this entire notebook, I'm not going to go through it cell by cell, but uh, what happens is we download the data, we plot the data, we plot it in three dimensions. And then here in this function, we are running the um, existing space component together with the existing flow routers we have in LandLab or the first generation flow routers we have in LandLab. And then in a second um, instance, or before we go to the second instance, we plot erosion. So from the start of your um, from the starting DEM to um, the DEM you get after running the space fluvial incision and deposition algorithm for a bunch of time steps. So we see it's it's pretty steep topography, so you dominant, dominantly have erosion in this case. Um, and then in the second part of the notebook, we do exactly the same, but this time we use um, the priority flood flow router and the space large scale eroder component to calculate exactly the same. Um, processes, basically erosion and deposition using the space component. And again, you see a map with the erosion um, in space. And then if you compare the performance of both algorithms, you see that we gain a lot by using this uh, priority flood flow accumulator combined with the new space component. So this is interesting, especially when you're simulating larger domains. If, you, if you're interested in simulating a large domain, I would totally recommend um, to use these components. So we did a small performance test and you see how it's increasing. Um, so the blue line is with the default flow routers and the orange line is with the priority flood flow routers. And you can gain like several orders of magnitude of time, um, especially when using larger grids. And the reason why is because the uh, priority flood flow router is based on the rich dam package. And as I mentioned earlier, the rich dam package uses parallelization, which is especially interesting here in this case, uh, because large DEMs um, otherwise just fill up your memory and slow down everything um, by, a big, by a big amount of, of time. All right, so 
going This is the danger of doing stuff uh, live, I guess. Uh, I can just fill a little bit of time uh, until Benjamin comes back. Uh, Benjamin worked for a long time on this, and actually, it's kind of neat the uh, the pull request for to put all of this software back into Land Lab uh, took a long time in order to make it all really good. And so, there's lots of tests, uh, lots of performance checks. So he spent a lot of time on this, and it's really cool to see his uh, his work get get there. Um, uh, one other thing I can talk about, maybe just as a quick, um, oh, the good there's bench, but okay, all right, I'll shut up. Hello, I'm back. Sorry about that, my internet um, dropped. Can you hear me fine right now? Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna go back to this tutorial I was showing. All right, um, so yeah, let's run our model to a steady state, and I'm just saying that we use classical theory here, so we evolve towards um, a fixed um landscape through time so basically you run your landscape for a number x amount of time you run it to a steady state and then on this steady state topography we're going to insert landslides um, something interesting to look at is like the the shape of the landscape before we insert landscapes landslides so we see a, a kind of fixed topography and more or less uniform so thickness and then on this topography we are going to um, to add landslide activity. So we do that by initializing the bedrock landslider component and by running it in, in a for loop. So this is going to happen over here, where we say um, update the flow router, run the space model to calculate erosion and deposition, and then um, run the highlands or better the bedrock um, landslider component for um, 200 years. So we run um, 10 time steps of 20 years, so 200 years in total. And then in the end, you visualize the output, the magnitude frequency distribution of your landslides. You plot of your landslides, you can plot erosion and deposition as we did before. And if you combine that in a figure as we did before, you see that you have your relief with the red cells indicating erosion and the blue cells indicating deposition. So that's about what I wanted to show you. Um, and now I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint slides. Oops. There we are. So um, one question you might have is how can we run all of this uh, on our own computer? Mark, do you see the slides now? No, slides aren't up. They are not? No. Sorry. No worries. That should be better. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so I'm gonna share this, this slide deck so that you can just go there and click the different links. Basically, you have two, two options. You install um, the LandLab software on your own machine or you use um, our CSDMS Jupyter Hub. 
and um, to install or to if, if you want to use a CSD image, Mark is going to say a couple of words about that. <laughs> oh, thanks, Benjamin. Yeah, so the, the Jupyter Hub is a really cool thing. It's a it's an always on compute resource. So not only can you run notebooks like Benjamin's, for example, but it's really a Linux machine on the cloud that you can use. Uh, any, anyone who's a CSD MS member can get uh, an account and just go through the, the link that Benjamin has provided. Um, it's kind of neat. Several professors around the country have already used it to teach classes, which is really cool. Um, we can help you get it set up. Um, it has all of our software as well, so that makes it really easy to use. So just in general, I think it's a really cool community computing resource. All right, back to you, Benjamin. Oh no, maybe not back to Benjamin. Oh, there we go. All right. Back to you, Benjamin, if you're there. I am. Oh, good. Yeah, okay. So, awesome. Flaky internet connection. Um, that doesn't usually happen to me. And of course, it does now. So um, let's see. We're going to go back to this presentation. Oops. OK. So that's the Jupyter Hub. If you want to use it, um, there's like one more thing I wanted to say. That's like on this link, you can actually find the GitHub repository for the stuff I've been showing today. You can just navigate to that GitHub and you're going to find a direct link to actually load all of these notebooks in your own CSDMS Jupyter Hub space. So you can just um, go there and, and click that link to try it on yourself. So I just want to wrap up now, basically. And I want to quickly come back to this question we asked in the beginning. How can we use all these numerical tools to actually learn something about the impact of landslides on landscape evolution? And to answer that questions, what we to answer those questions, what we did is simulating landscape evolution under, dip, under different uplift gradients. So basically, if you have very low amounts of uplift, you're going to evolve towards a situation where relief or topography is not steep enough to actually see landslide activity. So that's what you see in the left um, column of this figure. So you evolve towards a fluvially dominated landscape, which is going to evolve towards a fully fixed steady state uh, with uniform erosion. And the second plot is showing salt thickness so uniform erosion, uniform salt thickness, and no landslides. And by bumping up uplift rates, you basically trigger a bunch of landslides because you increase topographical relief. And I did a zoom of these figures in the next slide, where you see that the left-hand picture is the one with only fluvial processes going on. The right-hand figure is the one with a bunch of landslides going on. And interestingly, what we see is very similar to what we saw in the real landscapes I talked about in the very beginning of the webinar, where you see quasi planar slopes with narrowly, spiced, nar narrowly um, spaced um, channel features. So by doing this landslide erosion, we actually generate a topography that is very similar to what we see in landslide dominated terrain. And there's a bunch of older topographic metrics we can compare, and we see similar stuff. Um, but one more thing I want to come back to is this slope frequency distribution. And very much like what we saw in our um, real topography, we also simulate slope frequency distributions where a bunch of slope patches are exceeding this theoretic, theoretical angle of repose. So in this model runs, we actually use um, a theoretical angle of internal friction of 1.2 meters per meters. And you see that there's a bunch of cells or pixels that are actually exceeding this theoretical value. And the reason for that is because we use um, a stochastic algorithm. So we allow slopes to over steepen beyond their theoretical angle of repose. So that's like regarding the questions of the um, 
morphology of your landscapes. Now we had this other question about landscape dynamism. Um, so to understand what's going on there, um, I have this, this little movie where you see how fluvial profiles evolve through time. And in the left-hand plot, you see a fluvial channel evolving under low uplift rates. So it's going to be dominated by fluvial processes. And indeed, it evolves to a steady state and it doesn't really move any. Um, it doesn't really move a lot. Whereas on the right-hand side, you have higher uplift rates, which are um, creating steeper relief, triggering these landslides, and creating a bunch of irregularities over your fluvial channels. So what you see is, um, if you would pause the video like this, um, you're going to see on the profile, you're going to see um, blue spots, which are basically landslide damp lakes um, with, with orange bumps, which is a sediment deposited by rivers. You're also going to see gray bumps, which, is the, which represents the formation of um, epigenetic gorges, where your water is basically rerouted out of your former valley um, into, um, into what used to be the valley flanks. And all of this um, dynamics, all of this um, irregular dynamics are going to um, result in landscapes that are not really fixed in time anymore. And this is like my final um, slide of the day where you see again, these two end member landscapes. And on the left hand side, you see a landscape that's evolving under purely fluvial conditions. So it's going to a fixed steady state where your valleys and ridges remain fixed through time. And in the right hand side, what you see is um, the impact of landslides on the um, stability of your landscape in a dynamic equilibrium. And contrary to the left hand landscape, where you evolve towards fixed steady states, with landslides, you're going to have ridges that are laterally mobile through time and then keep on being mobile. So this simulation is after 250 million years. So that's a very long time. It's longer than it took for Africa and um, South America to um, get apart. So I can replay the movie. So you will see some dynamism in the left hand figure in the very beginning. But then towards the end, you only see um, dynamism of the valleys and uh, um, riches in the simulations where you have landslides. So it seems that landslides are indeed a process that do explain this lateral mobility that we observe in both um, experimental setups as well as in, in theoretical uh, derivations. So that's all I wanted to tell you. Um, thanks a lot for being here today. Um, I'm really happy that there's so much interest um, in simulating landslides. And obviously, I also want to thank a bunch of people that worked on uh, this project over the last couple of years. So if you have questions, uh, feel free to unmute yourself or you can also put them in the chat window. I have a question about the stochastic driver. Oh, sorry, Lynn. I jumped in before you said to please ask. No, no, go ahead. Sure. Um, you, uh, I'm, I guess I'm just wondering how much um, like this is driven by a Poisson distribution. Um, you know, how, how much all of this work would change with a different uh, distribution and, and whether that's sort of like a major driver that, um, I don't know, it's a, an assumption we're making. Right. So for the temporal, so the, there's a, the spatial probability and then there's a temporal, temporal probability and the temporal probability, we sample from a Poisson distribution. You can sample from another distribution. It's not really going to change a lot. What is mainly controlling the temporal probability is this return time for landslides or the return time for a shaking event, if you want. Um, so yeah, you can obviously use other distributions to sample from. That would be a nice exercise. But it's okay. dominantly the return time for landslides that's going to influence the amount of events you see. Cool. Thanks.
Yes. So there's a question on how the landslide material um, is distributed down uh, down slope of the critical node, basically. Um, a question from Alison. Thank you, Alison. So um, we use um, a nonlinear diffusion algorithm to do that. It's an algorithm published by uh, Sebastian Cartier in 2016. Um, and basically, it's going to depend on a transport length scale you're going to derive from the steepness of your topography. So the steeper the topography, the higher the transport length scale, and the further your sediment will be um, transported downslope. So you can actually end up with, imagine you have a landslide in very steep terrain. Most of your sediment that's uh, being distributed downslope of your critical node um, is going to go pretty far and almost all the way to your valley bottom. Whereas if you have like a gentle topography with a landslide somewhere in the middle, the sediment is, the transport length scale is going to be shorter because you have like gentle topography and most of the material is going to be deposited pretty close to the critical node of your landslide. Um, does sediment completely evacuate the slide plane? Yes, it does. Um, and that's one of the things um, we might be looking in for a future versions of the bedrock uh, landslider component. So one of the ideas might be to have um, a landslide where part of the material is actually um, still sitting in the landslide scar so that it's not like completely evacuated downslope, but like only partly. So that's a current assumption we make that all of the sediment is being evacuated. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. All right, there's a question from Miguel. In terms of runout, is it fair to think that the nonlinear model captures some characteristic, some characteristics of the runout in debris flows or other similar flows? And so we've been um, thinking about debris flows because what we see in our landscapes, if we simulate landslides, the last picture I, sh I showed is basically that because we have this intermittent behavior of um, sliding erosion, sliding erosion, we are kind of mimicking a process um, that's like often associated with debris flows in the sense that um, it's going to be a combination of um, gravity and fluvial incision that actually creates this um, linear, closely spaced channels. Um, so they are definitely related, but that's something we have to figure out uh, to what extent um, this mimics debris flow. Yes, uh, can you hear me, Dr. Comfort? Yeah, thank you, Jean. Okay, thank you. And I, I just have a, want to ask you if you have any thoughts about on, on how this mechanism of like migrating divides translating to the submarine realm. That's something I'm wondering about a lot. And, and I would like to, to just have your thoughts, thoughts about it. Um, yeah, I, I didn't really get uh, Arto translating into, into which uh, thing? Oh, oh, the submarine, the submarine oh, realm. Oh, okay. Um, Interesting question. Uh, that's that's a difficult one to answer, um, especially because um, in in the submarine world, um, sediment transport is going to be or might be pretty different and dependent on your uh, marine flows as well. So basically, a lot of the mobility in terms of like riches and valleys we see in our landscapes is because the sediment that's derived from these landslides is kind of pushing your fluvial channels out of their uh, former valleys. Um, so, and I don't really know how that process would translate in a submarine world, but it's like, that's a good, that's a good thing to think about. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think it's my turn. Hi, Sergio. Hi. Yeah, Benjamin, thanks so much for this. Uh, lecture. I, you know, I learned about this before, but I, today I learned even more. So my question is: the last few slides you showed comparison of identical landscape 
under two different conditions, one with uplift, one with no uplift. Um, but I think another utility of this model is to understand and, and forecast what the impact of climate change is. Um, and I think it has something to do with the stochasticity um, component of the, the highland. Um, if we can make some inference of how the landscape will evolve as we enter a different climate regime, um, ha has, I mean, is that something that we could do with this model? Absolutely, that, that's, that's definitely one of the things we will be looking into in the future. Um, so with climate change, we're going to see um, increased storm intensity. So not necessarily, not, not necessarily more rain, but um, a lot of like big storms. And of course, these storms will increase your poor water pressure and thus trigger more landslides, probably. That's the assumption we have for now. But there's a couple of unknowns in the equation. Um, so the landslides we are talking about today are deep-seated bedrock landslides. And there's actually recent work by Alison Duval that's, that's showing that uh, precipitation might be driving uh, deep-seated landslides to a bigger extent than actually earthquakes do. Um, so this is one of the things we, we, will be we will be looking into, to what extent actually um, earthquake versus precipitation triggers um, are influencing landslide extent. Um, and to do that, we, we have to think how to bring in this triggers explicitly, explicitly in the algorithm. Because as you know, like now we have this stochastic algorithm that's like causing the triggering of an event. And if we move to earthquakes or storms, we have to bring that trigger explicitly in, into the model. But that's like for sure one thing to look into. And then a second component is, um, so we do mostly um, deep-seated landslides, but it's well known that um, rainfall triggers landslides are, are often shallow landslides as well, because you're going to see an increase in poor water pressure. And especially on this interface between soils and bedrocks, um, you're going to see more sliding. And um, currently, we don't have um, algorithms to, to do this shallow landslide. So we have the gravitational um, sliding, but we don't have shallow landslides. So that's something else we should extend into um, if you want to understand, if you want to fully understand what the impact of, of storms would be on um, sediment mobilization. And related to that, actually, um, there's a nice paper on, on the role of, of sediment thickness in controlling shallow landslides. And like one of the current debates is whether it's sediment thickness or um, sediment availability that's controlling shallow landslide activity rather than precipitation. So that's like um, a question tang tangential to the, to the uh, precipitation debate. Do we have any further questions? I don't think so. so I think we... that's it for now, Benjamin. Excellent. So thank you all for being here today. That's really appreciated. And uh, see you all soon.